mean, I love, I love, I love actually, I love watching them close up like this as well because you get to get really up close and personal with them, which you just wouldn't in the wild. I love watching the way they hunt for their food and the way they sort of move through the plants. It's really interesting. You can see all about four of them piled up at the moment because they can smell food in here, but they can't quite find it. So uh, they're just sort of snuffling about looking for it at the moment, and I think they'll find it eventually. But uh, they're not the brightest creatures, like I say. these guys are found primarily is Lake, uh, I could be pronouncing it wrong, it's Xochimilco in uh, Mexico. I've worked at Blue Reef for about five years now, I've been in the animal care team for about three of those and I'm an aquarist here, so uh, like a zookeeper but a bit wetter basically. I want to be able to help to look after all the animals that we have here at the aquarium. where they actually remain in a juvenile state. So uh, much like uh, other amphibians like frogs, they start out life as a, as a tadpole, which then uh, develops uh, front legs and eventually back legs, and you then, before eventually becoming typically a fully formed adult. The unusual thing about axolotls is that they stay in this juvenile state. This is the most fascinating thing about axolotls, it's this ability to regenerate their limbs. And Although it is something we see in uh, other types of salamander and other types of amphibian as well, they don't do it quite as well as axolotls. I and mean, that's what scientists think is why they stay in this juvenile state. They can regenerate limbs very readily effectively, but not only that, actually they can also regenerate parts of their brain and their parts of their spine and their eyes as well. Just general understanding of how their bodies work can open up a lot of insight into how potentially things can be carried out in the future. We're achieving similar things in humans. The main thing that's causing these guys to be so threatened and endangered in the wild at the moment now is loss of their habitat. Um, the main reason that's happening is due to pollution. In 1998, there was a survey that one study showed that it was about 6,000 per square kilometre, uh, which is pretty reasonably abundant. Uh, in recent decades, though, as well, I mean, I think about the year 2000, it had gone down to only about 1,000 per square kilometre, um, so less than a sixth of what the population was just a few years beforehand. And in most recent surveys, in just the last few years or so, we're looking at as few as about 100 to maybe even as low as 35 or so individuals per square kilometre, which is barely any at all, which is why some scientists are thinking it may actually be time to declare them extinct in the wild. Mostly that's due to urbanisation around Mexico City, things like uh, pollution coming into the water, uh, reduction of habitats due to humans being more built up around that particular area, and just reduction of space, and what space is left is not very clean or ideal for them. One of the most special things for me is that I get to work with them, that these, these fascinating creatures that are not only important to science but important to the public as well to see what we're doing here at Blue Reef. All the ones we have are quite old, they're all ex-zoo animals or, or ex-pets. Uh, that have, we've sort of dubbed them as being retired because of where they're so quite old and a bit, a bit past it or so we thought but after introducing these guys together we actually saw some eggs being laid so they clearly had other ideas and said we're not so retired after all and we've actually had quite a lot of breeding from them since.
with many things. I think just education is the key to it. And as soon as you start talking to people about facts and figures of um, sort of ecosystem and biodiversity loss, they can be quite shocked and then be more interested in it. Exotels are so isolated because the lake that they live in will have such a unique set of like habitat features, whether that's temperature pH of the water um, that maybe doesn't match anywhere else in the surrounding area that they would have just never had the chance to spread out. It will be similar to isolated habitats around the world like Madagascar, the Galapagos, where you find these endemic little pockets of biodiversity that you just don't see anywhere else. I think it's important to look at rather than the survival of this species or the survival of our species we should look at it as the survival of our entire environment as one and being able to look at it from that kind of global perspective and that's the most important thing is what's the best for what's the best thing for the earth one of the biggest ways we can do this is just by adopting a more global consciousness don't just think about how your actions affect you or your family or your friends. Think about how they affect your immediate local environment and think about how they affect your global environment as well by extension. I mean sometimes we might have to ask ourselves a hard question is are human beings the best thing for the earth and the answer is in a lot of time no we aren't. It's up to us to and take measures to improve that as well and to be responsible for the creatures that we are caretakers for essentially in a lot of ways and um, not just people in jobs like myself who literally care for animals but all of us everywhere in our whole globe.